All right. Can everyone see my screen here? Yep. Yep. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, I think, uh, first of all, thanks for having me. It's great. Um, I'm not a big fan of virtual backgrounds, but I found this. This is the Ether Dome at the MGH. So I think for any of the students here who, who haven't been, I think it's it's really cool to check out. Um, you know, it's like one of the oldest um, auditorium, surgical theaters in the country. And it's definitely a highlight. I think once, uh, you know, as COVID settles down, it'd be great to, to um to welcome students here and to, to see it in person. It's, it's really a treat. So um, anyway, I thought I'd, I'd share some aspects of a spine oncology and from a neurosurgeon's perspective. And uh, I have some, just a bunch of slides to go over some didactics, but uh, we can uh, please feel free to interrupt and um, ask any questions if there's anything um, that's interesting or confusing. Um, and, you know, we can do this for about 20 minutes or so and just see, uh, how it goes. And, uh, but please feel free to, uh, to interrupt. So, um, again, I'm at the MGH and I'm an attending neurosurgeon here and I specialize primarily in spinal disorders, uh, but specifically with an interest in spine oncology and uh, spine tumors, as well as spinal deformity surgery. And I know that, um, if it hasn't been done earlier, I think someone else will talk about deformity, but, um, I thought I'd just give a, a, a quick overview on some aspects of what it is that, you know, we typically see as neurosurgeons in this domain. All right. So, uh, first off, you know, we'll go over some aspects of spine tumors. And when we think of spine tumors, it's, it's a pretty broad subject because it really involves tumors that constitute and involve uh, the entire uh, nervous system, including the bone um, around the nervous system. So when you think about the skull base from, you know, the neck all the way down to the sacrum, you know, as neurosurgeons, we deal with tumors that arise not only from the bone, uh, but from the joints, uh, the bone, the vertebrae, but also uh, from within the spine, um, from elements like the dura, as well as the spinal cord itself, the nerve roots themselves. So as rare as these tumors are, uh, it keeps us very busy as neurosurgeons. So, and I think depending on your practice, your interests and what you're exposed to, uh, you know, the, the constitution of uh, sort of spine tumors in your practice may vary. Uh, but I would say that this is something that, you know, typically the average practicing neurosurgeon will see, okay? Um, and so there are a lot of different types of tumors. Uh, we can sort of think of them as intradural, meaning they're within the dura. I think many of you have learned that, you know, there are different layers uh, of the, uh, the dura, I mean, the, the structures that surround the brain and the spine. And uh, the dura is sort of that, uh, that barrier that separates the uh, cerebrospinal fluid and the neural elements from the outside world. And so when we, when we think about the dura, we have tumors that are considered intramedullary and extramedullary. And that basically what that means is, you know, within or outside the spinal cord. So extramedullary tumors are most common in that space. And those are the tumors that are sort of outside the actual substance of the spinal cord. Okay. And intramedullary means tumors that are actually within, um, you know, the, the, the gray matter, the white matter of the spinal cord. Okay. Um, and most of these tend to be benign, uh, but there are tumors, especially intramedullary tumors that can be uh, malignant. And these are very difficult to treat. And, uh, but the intramedullary tumors are more common in children. Uh, and so just overall, we can think of that space. We think of extramedullary, intradural, intramedullary. And you can see here that in that extramedullary space, most of these tumors are schwannomas, uh, neurofibromas, meningiomas. I'll show some examples of that. Uh, inside the spinal cord, most commonly there are ependymomas and astrocytomas. I think the last speaker mentioned hemangioblastomas, uh, which have elements of vascularity and are, are more like vascular malformations actually. And then we have metastatic disease, which is much more rare as well as uh, primary tumors of the bone, okay? 
And again, here's just some examples. For the most part, we're seeing benign tumors are mostly schwannoma, meningioma, neurofibroma. And because they're so common, this is typically what we see in practice in these patients. Sometimes they're actually picked up incidentally. Um, as you may know, neck pain, low back pain is pretty common. Uh, many people have these symptoms and you know they may get worked up by their primary care doctor with plain x-rays or oral medications like anti-inflammatory medications. Uh, but when the symptoms persist and you know someone starts to have maybe numbness, pain in the arm or a leg, uh, and sometimes if they're having some subtle signs of imbalance, uh, difficulty walking, maybe their fine motor coordination, their handwriting, dexterity are impaired, um, oftentimes these patients will get an MRI. So sometimes these are picked up incidentally, um, and sometimes, you know, as part of a workup for these symptoms, um, these, these lesions will be identified. Uh, and most commonly, these, these patients are evaluated first with an MRI that's not without any contrast. So, uh, but usually if there is any suspicion for a lesion there or a tumor, uh, the patients will have a repeat MRI uh, with contrast. And, and this is part of the normal sort of learning process too, not only for primary care physicians, but also our residents in training when we're seeing patients in the emergency room or consultate or cons consultant on these patients, we'll often ask them to repeat an MRI with contrast because it really helps us look at the vascularity uh, and on other features, which I'm gonna show you, okay? Um, again, this is the distribution of the tumors that we see here. And mostly are meningiomas or nerve sheath tumors. Okay. And this is just an example of what we're seeing by that. Okay. So um, on the image to the left, you can see the dura has been opened. So typically uh, with these operations, we're doing this under the microscope. And you can see here that um, this is the dura, and the dura has been opened. There are tack up sutures around that. Uh, and we usually surround that with cottonoids or patties to prevent sort of bleeding coming into the field. The last thing that uh, you want is to have so much blood and other things that are really clouding your visualization. And when you look closely, you can see also there's some arachnoid here. So we have the different layers, right? So there's the dura, arachnoid, and pia. And uh, the pia is really, is really on the surface uh, and you, it's hard to see without really being under the microscope. But here you can see the arachnoid uh, that's there. And, and we sort of cut those bands with micro scissors just to really open up and really want to visualize everything and try to find a plane between the tumor and the underlying spinal cord and the normal nerves. So you can imagine if we're trying to take out the structure that should not be there, but for some reason, mother nature has placed it there to get it out safely without harming the patient, that is the real technical challenge, right? So we want, you know, these patients who are having surgery, most of the time are having some sort of symptom, right? It could be arm pain, weakness, hand pain, weakness, change in dexterity, can actually affect your balance and coordination if it's putting enough pressure on the spinal cord. So the challenge in training is obviously to take, you know, medical students to, chief residents and beyond, right? To get to the point where um, you're looking at the photo, but in years time, you're gonna be able to take out these tumors. And so the challenge is, you know, obviously learning the approach, but also the nuances of getting the tumor out safely without causing harm or damage or complications to that patient. And complications do happen. This is neurosurgery, this is microsurgery. So these things certainly can happen. And we're, we're, we're talking about millimeters and fractions of millimeters of space um, that we're working with fine instruments. So there are some operations we do as neurosurgeons, especially spine surgeons with trauma and deformity that are very macro uh, in view, involving a lot of instrumentation and bone osteotomies and a lot of real uh, labor, laborious type of techniques. But uh, with this, this is real microsurgery. And you can see here from the caption uh, that this is sort of what it looks like. These are cauda equina nerve roots. And this is the tumor that's coming out. And sometimes it's difficult to really differentiate what the tumor is compared to the, uh, the surrounding uh, normal neural tissue because the tumor itself 
you can see there are a lot of blood vessels, there are veins, there are blood vessels around it. It almost looks like a parasite and sometimes really identifying what the difference is between the tumor and the nerve or the spinal cord underneath can be very difficult, okay? And then this is just an image of what that looks like afterwards. So this tumor was basically um, an ependymoma at the junction between the conus medullaris and the cauda equina. So you can see the conus up here and the cauda equina, that's the horsetail, right? So that those are the lumbar nerve roots, lumbosacral nerve roots all going down distally. And you can see here that that tumor has been taken out. So when you look at the, you know, what it looks like when you first open the dura and it's, it's pretty crowded, right? It's, it's, it's a structure, it's something that's there that shouldn't be there. And it's pushing on the neurological elements, which then translates to symptoms in the patient. And afterwards, things are pretty opened up, and then we end up closing that patient. This is a, a illustration um, from Ann Osborne's book. I think for students, I have no, um, you know, conflict to disclose or anything with uh, Ann Osborne, who's a neuroradiologist and, and a real legend in that field. And um, I, when I was a student and actually a resident, I found uh, her textbooks to be really remarkable, especially studying for neurosurgery boards, um, great visuals and illustrations. And so um, without having any association, I'm just gonna plug her work, but this is taken from one of her textbook and this demonstrates sort of an axial view representation of uh, a nerve sheath tumor, okay? So you can see here, this the representation of the spinal cord. This is the vertebral body at that level. You can see the nerve root coming out the various ganglion, the nerve rootlets, posterior elements. Uh, the, the fecal sac is outlined here, as well as sort of the graphic representation of what sort of a nerve sheath, this is a, a dumbbell shaped tumor looks like. So you can imagine from the, the neurosurgical perspective, it's, you know, how do we achieve the goals of surgery, which is to take out this tumor safely, not injuring the spinal cord, which has clearly been pushed over, and also identifying and preserving the nerve root that's coming out of this foramen, which we can't see. We clearly can't see that, right? So it's really understanding how to get this out safely, identifying normal, identifying abnormal, and working from normal to abnormal to get the tumor out, providing not only histologic diagnosis for what it is, but also decompressing that patient to provide um, you know, improvement of their symptoms. And so that's the challenge. So a lot of the, uh, I think if you've, if you've seen talks through this platform from colleagues doing brain tumor surgery or intracranial work in neurosurgery, a lot of it are very similar principles, you know, but I think I would argue uh, as someone who does exclusively spine surgery that it's a little more challenging in our situation because we can't, you can't really retract on anything in this area. You can't retract on the spinal cord. You can't really move it around so much uh, because it's very sensitive to manip manipulation. And again, some high powered views of just what that looks like when we open the dura. You can see the spinal cord here, a lot of the vessels on the, what we call the dorsal surface. So the dorsal surface is sort of um, if a patient is prone lying on their abdomen and we're opening up the back, the dorsal surface is sort of the, the top down bird's eye view of the elements. And so, um, you know, using intraoperative microscopes now, we can visualize that very well. You can see nerve roots that are coming off the spinal cord. And so you can imagine using various instruments, we can work in that space. Again, we're talking about millimeters of space, not inches, but we can work in that space, cut the arachnoid that's there, move the work underneath the spinal cord uh, to find, you know, the, the nerves that are there and also the tumor that's there, okay? We can imagine when the tumor is, let's say, outside, if it's between the dura and the actual surface of the spinal cord and just pushing down on the nerve root of the spinal cord, that's one set of challenges, right? But can you imagine if there's a tumor actually within the spinal cord itself, you know, we have to get in there somehow, right? So that becomes another challenge. It's how do you find the right working plane? It's sort of like taking apart a bomb, right? When you watch movies, it's like, is it the red wire, blue wire, green wire? It's like, where are we gonna go here? Um, what's the safe passageway to get into the substance? And I'll show some examples of that. 
Uh, this is just some more high-powered uh, magnif magnified views of sort of looking for that lesion here. The lesion is ventral, so, sort of anterior or in front of the spinal cord, and it's finding it, right? And so, yes, we can mobilize things somewhat, nerve roots, we can retract gently as needed, uh, but you're really not putting in large uh, retractors into that space uh, and eventually finding it, finding this lesion here to, and taking it out. This was a, this was a calcified, what's called a meningioma. It's a patient of mine that, that presented basically with difficulty walking, imbalance, weakness in the arms and the legs, losing function. And this is a sagittal MRI. And you can see the base of the brain. So this is the, the pons and the brainstem, cerebellum. Uh, this is the posterior aspect of the neck. This is the spinal cord coming down. And this is a contrast enhanced scan. You can see how this entire area lights up with contrast. And you notice that here's the pons, the brainstem, spinal cord below, but then you're not really seeing it in between just because it's so massive. And cal these meningiomas can be calcified, and this is what the CAT scan shows. This is a CT angiogram. So the CT angiogram is very helpful in neurosurgery to not only look at whether things are calcified, you can see the calcification of the skull, the clivus, uh, you know, things within the, uh, the mouth, uh, as well as the vertebrae. And you can see that this tumor is very calcified. So um, if it wasn't calcified, it would be gray but it helps me visualize where the blood vessels are around it, the vertebral arteries and whatnot. Last thing you wanna do is take out a tumor, cause a stroke or cause massive bleeding somehow. Uh, and then after surgery, you can see here that that space has been clearly opened up and now you can see the spinal cord coming down. You see the spinal fluid in front and behind that and uh, the improvement is dramatic. Uh, when we think about tumors, uh, I've shown you a lot of MRIs, some that one CT image, but MRI is really the gold standard because it really shows us what's going on here. Now, just to transition quickly to the intramedullary, intramedullary tumors that are within the spinal cord, this is the cartoon illustration demonstrating some of the most common things that we see, right? So an ependymoma is typically within the substance of the spinal cord. And what differentiates an ependymoma from most other tumors is that there's often a really nice plane that we can dissect, separating the ependymoma from the surrounding tissue, right? Uh, the spinal cord is a very small structure, um, probably the size of your ring finger. And so, you know, the idea is how do you carve out enough space to take something out carefully within something so small? And the advantage with an ependymoma is that most times there is a good plane that separates the tumor from the uh, surrounding tissue. Cavernous angioma is a vascular malformation that we see that typically bleeds and causes sort of a, a bruise or um, almost like a blood clot around that, that area. And these can be very devastating because they can bleed and cause pretty significant deficits like paralysis uh, on an acute nature. Astrocytomas are difficult because these are infiltrative neoplasms of various histologic grades from low grade to high grade. High grade being similar pathologically to glioblastoma in the brain. Uh, and these are very difficult to treat because um, you can't really cure these patients and you can't find typically an adequate plane of resection. Uh, and that's why in these cases, most of the time it's diagnosis intralesional debulking, uh, take the pressure away, create room, uh, and then palliative adjuvant therapies, whether that's radiation or clinical trials or other investigational drugs. But this is an area for any of the med students where there's a lot of interest in here, but the difficulty is that there's not enough tissue. These are rare tumors. Uh, and so it's very difficult to, to study these and, and create targeted therapies. But, you know, medicine is always evolving and that's you know, we're always thinking about the future of neurosurgery. So if it gives anyone ideas, this is an area of really great um, potential for therapeutic delivery and also targeted therapies. Hemangioblastoma, like you discussed before, it's more of a vascular lesion. Uh, then you have rare things like intramedullary schwannoma, as well as lipoma, which lipoma is just basically fat within the spinal cord, but can cause a lot of problems. Again, spinal cord tumors, ependymoma, astrocytoma, and this is again from Ann Osborne's book demonstrating uh, this is what an ependymoma looks like. You can see it's 
can be infiltrative, but usually separable from surrounding tissues. And again, this is the conus medullaris, caudiquina nerve roots coming down and um, tend to be uh, pretty large, spanning multiple levels in the spine. And this is a radiographic appearance of that, okay? Same thing, you can see this is an MRI contrast enhancement involving multiple levels that are there. And when you look at this, you may wonder, oh my goodness, it's like this is filling the entire spinal canals. Like how do you find the nerve roots? Where are the nerve roots? And typically the nerve roots are just sort of plastered all the way around. Uh, but once you open things up, take away enough bone to get in there, we can identify and see that. And this is just an illustration of an intramedullary tumor. You can see sort of a cartoon illustration of what that looks like. Okay. Um, so that's sort of the first uh, part of the, the slides I wanted to go through. And then um, I was gonna sort of uh, segue into um, just the next five minutes or so. Um, another, the, the most other common causes of spinal tumors that we see, which is, you know, from metastatic cancer. So, um, and just go into that briefly, and then we can definitely open up to questions or discussions on social, social case, show some cases as well. Um, but, you know, for spinal metastases, regardless of what you specialize in neurosurgery, uh, we're, you're going to see this because patients with cancer are going to develop metastases to the bone. And this is going to cause pain, um, a lot of pain in the neck, the low back. And it becomes difficult because we're trying to palliate these symptoms so that patients can undergo cancer therapies, whether you have breast cancer, prostate cancer, kidney cancer, uh, this is a challenge. So um, I think key points for students is that when we think about cancer, especially metastatic disease, it's all about palliation of pain, preserving their neurology, uh, local tumor control, and thinking about the invasiveness of this operation, right? So if you or your loved one has cancer, the last thing you wanna do is undergo some massive spine operation. Um, I think that's, that's sometimes not as productive, but sometimes it's needed though um, to achieve the goals. Here's a, here's a case. This is a patient with uh, lung cancer, metastases with spinal cord compression. It's at the T2 level. It's involving the vertebrae, there is tumor involving the posterior elements and severely compressing the spinal cord. The spinal cord is this gray structure here and the spinal fluid signal is absent there. Now this patient's already had radiation to the spine, but is impaired, but they're also failing other therapies, cancer related therapies. And the question is, what do we do for this patient? They come in, some patients come in paralyzed, some patients come in just weak, but they can't walk, they can't stand. Um, obviously, there's a lot going on in this patient's life in cancer, but this is pretty typical. So when our residents and students see this in the emergency room, everyone sort of has a really heightened sense of urgency, right? What do we do? What's the right thing for this patient? What's the morbidity of surgery? What are the goals of surgery? And can we get this patient walking again? walking again and address improvements of their symptoms so they can go on to fight the cancer, which we know is terminal. But we also know that with time, there are all these targeted therapies now that are changing the survival curve for these patients. And this is just an axial view showing the extent of spinal cord compression that's there. So there are a lot of different decision-making frameworks and the NOMS criteria is one that you're gonna see and hear a lot. It's basically N-O-M-S. This was developed by a neurosurgical colleague, Mark Bilski at the Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, Cancer Center. And it's just a framework and it's a way to think about how to assess these patients and something that you know we teach our students and residents and is thinking about N is the neurological status of the patient uh, o is the radio sensitivity of the cancer. Have they had radiation? What's the anticipated response rate of the cancer to radiation? And also mechanical stability of uh, the spine, right? Is it biomechanically stable? Can they stand? Can they walk? What kind of, are they just having horrible back pain that they're bed bound? And we think of S. So S stands for systemic. And this is where we have a lot of trouble. It's really predicting survival, anticipating complications, uh, what is the benefit of surgery, right? Is it worth it to the patient? It's a little more um, 
philosophical aspect of of this decision-making paradigm. But it's helpful to have some type of framework, right? So like anything in life, you have to have some type of decision-making framework uh, for how to decide whether to do something or not. Same thing in neurosurgery when we're thinking about operating on these patients. So we consider surgery stabilization when patients have fracture, kyphosis, deformity, uh, pain after radiation, or if we know that the operation that we're going to do is actually going to cause some type of instability. With any aspect in in the brain, I mean in the spine, um, there's going to be a certain pattern of pain, uh, and that involves you know um, at the cranial cervical junction if they have pain with head rotation, that typically is a key or a clue that there may be something erosive or damaging at that area. The same thing with the neck, flexion and extension causes significant amount of pain. Thracolumbar, standing, walking can be very difficult. We have tools called the SINs. It's the spine instability neoplastic score on your rotations. You'll probably be exposed to this when you're seeing um, patients, your resident or attending or chief resident may ask you, you know, what's the SIN score for this patient and how are you deciding to recommend surgery, you know, if you're covering the emergency room or following on the residents. And again, this has been uh, externally validated, and this is a very useful tool to, again, think about the components of the radiographic assessment and also the clinical assessment for uh, what type of pain they're having. And to put this together and to come up with sort of a score, um, and this can help guide decision-making in terms of whether this is surgical or not. We can use this to sort of gauge, hey, is this mechanically unstable? Should this patient have surgery? And, but you know, there are patients with high SIN scores, 12 to 18, that we don't operate on because maybe they're too sick or too frail. So, you know, there's not one component of this this decision-making algorithm that really drives the decision because there's so many factors to consider. Uh, when we think about oncology, we know that these patients don't have an infinite time spectrum, uh, unlike degen or deformity, where they don't have a terminal illness. We know that over time, you know, we put these screws and rods in, we do bone grafting, you know, with the hope that the bone is going to heal around the instrumentation. Uh, and over time, we know that with millions of cycles of loading, stress strain curves, we know that the instrumentation is going to fail to a certain degree. But hopefully over time, the bone will heal and override the mechanical stress on that. So I did uh, my fellowship like Dr. Rasuli at the Cleveland Clinic and Ed Benzel uh, was so influential, I think, on so many of us in neurosurgery. But I think having um, learned from him that, you know, especially in these cases, we have to be mindful about, you know, the integrity of the instrumentation early on because these patients are not going to survive and they really need that palliative benefit of stabilization up front. Surgery is not easy. Complications, readmissions are high. Instrumentation failure happens, right? Rods break, you know, cages subside. This happens in any aspect of neurosurgery, not just oncology. But you can imagine for a patient with cancer, if you take them through one operation and this happens, it's a real gut check and it's really difficult because last thing you want is them to interrupt their cancer therapy to have another operation. Uh, we looked at this. Now we have instrumentation. There, there are things called fenestrated screws where we can actually put cement through the screws into the bone to help solidify the bone and to increase the sort of uh, purchase power of the instrumentation because we know that these patients have poor bone quality because of the cancer themselves. And so we looked at this and demonstrated that there is pain benefit looking at these NIH promise patient reported pain outcome scores. And you'll see a lot of this in the surgical literature in terms of you know, patient outcomes, uh, pain responses, validated outcome measures. So when you're, you know, you're thinking about neurosurgery as a subspecialty, you're reading the journals, whether it's journal neurosurgery, spine, or neurosurgery, you know, at, at really um, you know, top shelf journals like those, you're, you're gonna see a lot of patient reported outcome data. So I would challenge and recommend, challenge you and also encourage you to really carefully scrutinize that data, but also to learn more about it. Learn about the instruments, uh, the outcome instruments, the statistical analyses used for that. Um, I think in this area of data science, machine learning, um, that that really is a, a, a skill set 
and a tool that is going to be so instrumental in neurosurgical, neurosurgical practice versus the sort of logistic regression and the traditional statistical methodologies that we've been using the last 10, 20 years. And so I'll just wrap up just demonstrating. So this is sort of some of the instrumentation systems that we use. We use, these are fenestrated towers that we inject cement through the screws into the bone. We can use navigation now using interoperative CAT scans, basically providing us with literally GPS to do targeted operations to put screws into the bone, trying to minimize the morbidity and the extent of surgery. And this is an intraoperative x-ray showing the screws as well as the cement fill into the bone. Okay, and again, using intraoperative computer navigation to help us um, place instrumentation accurately and safely into the bone. And this is just one example of how we can do that where this patient had surgery before, then they actually developed a real significant deformity or malalignment of the spine, and this patient couldn't stand up. Uh, and you could see that their spine is literally folded over. Uh, and so I ended up revising that patient, extending the instrumentation, but using the cement into the bone to further buttress that patient and provide stability. Okay. Um, and so again, just like that case I showed, just to wrap up, we can go through our algorithm. We know that this patient is neurologically impaired. We know that they've maximized radiation to that site. And even though radiation is attractive because it's invisible, it doesn't hurt, well, it shouldn't hurt, it's invisible, um, there are limits to it as well. And we can tabulate our SIN score, which in this case is 13. So as a student, a resident, you know that, wait, you know, I'm concerned about this patient because there are elements here which really support that this spine is unstable. And so we do an operation called separation surgery where we're taking this patient to surgery, we're stabilizing the bone around it and doing a maximal decompression, meaning we're taking the tumor out, the bone out. These are the nerve roots coming off the spinal cord. And at that level of T2, I'm drilling that down and resecting as much as I can see that's safe, not to get all the cancer out, but enough to give that patient space and time. And unlike the slides that I showed earlier, where we've opened the dura and we're looking all around the spinal cord, uh, in this case, we don't want to open the dura. We don't want to get that spinal fluid leak. Um, this patient's had radiation. And if we get a leak, you know, the radiation affects how all the tissues heal, including the bone, the dura, the muscle, the fat, the skin wound failure rates are higher, complications are higher. So that dura is, you know, we want to preserve that at all costs. And so you can imagine the challenges that we have as neurosurgeons where, yes, on one end of the spectrum, we're diving deep, we're opening the dura, we're, we're going for gold, we're opening the spinal cord to find that tumor. But then, you know, the other end of the spectrum too is, well, a lot of times we don't want to open the dura, we need to work around it take the pressure off, create all the space without paralyzing or impairing the patient. So clearly we're doing the operation to make the patient better uh, and also to help them with their overall cancer goals. And the goal is to make them better and not to paralyze them with the operation, which, which is a risk and, and, it can, and it can happen. And so this patient survived afterwards, obviously died later on 14 months later, but they've resumed their therapies after surgery, you can see clear improvement of that space around the spinal cord. Looks great, right? Here's a spinal cord. There's a space around it. This is the CAT scan showing how much bone I've taken out. And then that patient had high dose radiation afterwards. Okay. Um, and that's, that's the goal after there. So, um, but I'll wrap up there. Uh, and I just wanted to give an overview of some of the, the most common uh, tumors that we see and some of the sort of conceptual frameworks that we think about when we're thinking about spot oncology. Obviously, there's so much more, but I thought that this would just be a, a good sort of primer and overview. And I'm happy to, you know, take any questions or we can talk about anything you like uh, with, with that regard. I mean, the, the time is yours. So, so uh, thank you for uh, logging in and paying attention and uh, participating. So um, I'll conclude there. So thank you very much.
everyone. Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.